than me, but there are lots of familiar faces here in the audience as well, so that's great. Um, yeah, as Maria said, this is the first time we've had someone speaking or reading on this ecological narratives seminar, who's from within the school. It's so exciting, um, Cherry, to be able to celebrate the launch of this amazing book uh, with you tonight. I'm not going to give Cherry an extensive introduction. Uh, I promise that, but it's probably worth saying uh, a little bit about where she's coming from as a writer. So she's an Irish writer living in London. Um, and for those of you who go on to read this book, which I hope will be most of you, I think that's crucial. Her first two poetry collections, um, When Lights Go Up, The Lights Go Up in 2001, and One Wanted Thing, published in 2006, um, were both published by Lagan Press. Her third collection, Test, Orange 2012, and fourth, Spanish 2019, were published with Pindrop Press. Her debut novel, Hold Still, with Holland Park Press, appeared in 2013, um, and Famish tours as a performance in collaboration with the vocalist Lauren Kinsler and composer Ed Bennett. Um, and what I think is lovely about that kind of rather plainly read list, sorry, Cherry, is, is the kind of generic range there, the fact that we've got novels, uh, we've got poetry publication and kind of uh, mixed media, I suppose, performance as well. Cherry was nominated as a fellow for the Royal Society of Literature in 2022 and is also a Horsenden Fellow. She is Associate Professor in Creative and Critical Writing here at the University of Greenwich. What she's going to be talking to us about today and reading from is uh, her latest book, If the River is Hidden. Here it is. I got my copy yesterday. And um, this is a really recent publication and I can attest having speed read it on the train home last night and then reread it in the evening. Um, it is a really uh, amazing piece of work. I found it deeply moving um, and also very provocative and uh, very creative and kind of critical thinking about questions of diaspora, of habitat, of environment and of origins. So these are all questions I think that are crucial to our uh, ideas as they circulate around the idea of the ecological within this narrative series. So I'm super delighted, as I said. I'm not going to talk anymore. I'm just going to hand over to Cherry. So thank you again, Cherry. You're welcome. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Katarina, for inviting me. Thank you for coming, for finding the room. Um, as Katarina said, this book has just come out. So this is its South London premiere. Uh, what you were hearing was a soundtrack uh, composed by a flautist called Imer McGowan, who's from the north. And if you look in the first page of the book, we've got a QR code linked to that soundtrack, which I just thought was technologically amazing. And uh, it also has field recordings of the walk, uh, comments between me and my co-author Craig, and a few little snippets of interviews. We were dabbling with the idea of including more interviews in the book, but the creative process sort of emerged in a different form. Um, yeah, why walk the River Ban, Northern Ireland's longest river? In the midst of COVID, the idea of an 83 mile walk over eight days with a dear friend seemed like an impossible dream. I left Northern Ireland over 40 years ago, and my writing companion, Craig Jordan Baker, is third generation Irish, so only spent holidays there. What could we learn about the changing demographic of the North, where Catholics now outnumber Protestants? A third voice is emerging that's neither Republican or Unionist. What could the river teach us about ourselves and Irish identity, which is always in the same place, and yet it's never still. The book's hybrid form of prose and poetry reflects the hybridity of our conversation. One, one of us being from a uh, Unionist or Protestant background and the other from a Catholic back, background. And also the hybridity of the walk itself, walking, limping, singing, being bored, all those things that um, we try to braid together Often we'd no access to the river. It, there is no proper path. We were creating the path as we walked. And we often wondered walking along these long country roads, what the hell we were doing there? Um, and where would we find some vegan food? 2021 also marked the 100th anniversary of the formation of Northern Ireland when the border was established. And 
of course, there's now a lot of talk about reunifying and future Ireland and what is our place in that as diasporic, queer, third generation Irish people. So that idea of borders, both interior and exterior, was very important. Um, could, could the river provide a common ground for us in those, in those differences? So I'm going to read mostly my extracts. It is prose and poetry in the way it's set out. Um, and occasionally I'll try and indicate where I'm reading Craig's prose. Um, and uh, it's, uh, if you get a chance, we're going to, we've done two live performances, one with a fiddler and one with a flautist. And uh, it really does kind of obviously enliven it very much with the music playing almost the river between us. So tonight you're getting a very special but solo performance. <laughs> it was on the day after the summer solstice that they set out to walk the 83 miles from the source of the ban to its mouth. This is the way that they went. North and northeast from Deer's Meadow, the nebulous source. Through Catesbridge, a frost hollow, where cool air creeps down the coldest place in Ireland. Through Bambridge Town in the County Down, where the river snakes through Solitude Park, and the bunting, red, white and blue, flickers true. By Porter Down, where a new emotion was found. Are you feeling down? No, I'm feeling ported down. Which if you've ever been there, you will know why. <laughs> Up towards Banff Foot, where the river's upper course washes into Loch Ney, and then over Loch Ney, where a silent landscape sits underwater. Through Tomb, where brickworks gouged clay from the ban, and where the trickler flies. And past Port Clonone, where the ban is broad and black, through Bendora, where they can remember little, and to Port Stewart, home of the mouth, and where I grew up. Spelgadam to Catesbridge. Deer's meadow leapt its doe brown hide through me in a London house. Deer's meadow, where the seeking sought with a journey opened under any kind of sky. The name showed a start. Deer had been there and a deer hunter and it rolled its high grassiness in my city mind. It threw me, threw me where the journey opened, where the journey opened in my city where the seeking sought high grassiness. And I saw sleeve muck lift its snout and bubble a clear marble of water. And we'd kneel and ask the white cow, bow fin, to bless our trek north. Help us leave the mountain when we'd rather not, like any hero on a quest, whose horse is underfed and weapon blunt. Names are the maps that preceded any map. Names are the caps that the land first wore. Can this be an Irish poem? When we first met, walking the dark back from a pub, Craig said, I made an Irish library in my head and called it home. We spoke of being frauds, to work in words I had to leave, I told him, 40 years of weighing Ireland. What will we find beside the ban, inside the van, beside each other, inside ourselves? How else to take the North? of surnames, legends, photographs, make a frame big enough for London to stand in. Welcome to Newry, Morn and Down, where an ewer, moorn, agus and dune are scratched out at the metal edge of the tongue's border. Up Bog Road, along Faux Fanny Road, to Spelga Dam, Spelga was sweetened yogurt, not Spielgach, place of pointed rocks. One pot, one lunch, my anorexic will, eating Irish all those teenage years, unaware of its source. Skylarks spark off the slope that gives us pyramid orchids. The trickster source is stowed and soaks up 
five streams of a stony star. Is this it? Where is the sky reflecting bauble I have dreamt? Craig claims it to the east, me further north. The mountain is releasing secret rains, and we're apprentices in origins, can't read the incline signs. Beyond the dam, the long-limbed Anbana, the goddess, takes her rise, her feet fresh, defining her own route to North Terminal, where her world opens into all worlds. The true source hangs in cloud above Deer's Meadow, recalling salt. I want to know its circular transfiction, sun steam from sea, fall to ground, breathing rain. No, oh, why did that stop, I wonder? Looking for the source, startle yellow asphodels, heart beats in the feet. For months, I touched the goddess via fluorescent highlighter, and now its slender strewn over rocks is muted, droughtish. Climate, climate panic flashes through me. Can this be the river? Can this be the river's future? The deep, broad childhood river that transported coal to coal rain. This is Craig's voice. The English are noted for being passive aggressive. In Northern Ireland, I've found, I've not found pass passive aggression, but I've found passivity and aggression. The aggressions there and the flags, the bunting, the bonfires with hated names burning, the signs to repent, and the slogans never to surrender, the graffiti for the UDA, the IRA, where the Irish never forget and the English never remember. But then it's not all murals and marches and memorials. Discounting the shrillness of callers to radio phone-ins, there can be a studied reticence about identity, at least when you don't know who you're talking to. Is this a shyness, a politeness? Whatever it is, it's hardly new. There's a known path that's been paved with oblique questions. How do you spell your name? What school did you go to? Who's your da? People knew the game and knew it was being played. You know who were in charge. Can this be an Irish place? Tatesbridge to Bambridge. Give me compied the pilgrim's plaster. The feat's story has begun the sorry rub of 16 miles. I channel pressure to the instep, the heel anywhere but the toes. The map is a shield, Craig says, but it shows no river map at Catesbridge. Margaret comes to our aid, points out past the abandoned railway, the renovated schoolhouse, go through my ground to the left corner. If anyone says anything, just said, say Margaret said it was okay. Yesterday, men healing walls and weatherproofing fences only grunted, we're thirsty for Margaret. It's very cold here, frost hollow, she says, minus 18 in the winter and lonely. Cancer took her husband last year, and many years before, girls would wash their clothes in the river. One time, an eerie wailing made them gather up their laundry and rush home. One girl, hunkered at the water, heard nothing. Later, they heard she drowned. Whoever doesn't hear the banshee is about to die. The ban is shallow, lane narrow. We meet no one, can't utter Margaret's password. 
A froth of white flowers floats down river, pipes sneak in carrying runoff. The crow's foot will die if slurried too much. If the river is hidden, so is what enters it. The car smell is heavy and moldy, pig smell acrid and high, the poultry rotting shells and seaweed, everywhere the whiff of shite, and where to put it. Wex Wexford, Norfolk, agribusiness is too big for its shit. We swipe off sticky clegs, the goddess is wailing, and no one can hear. Outside Bambridge, the soft day never wakes up. It's a day to let sadness silt. We hack back nettle corridors, climb buried stiles, crawl under fences to avoid electrocution. Recreating a lost path makes a bond that beats eco-anxiety for a while. A ship's hull looms from the opposite bank with rigging and a pulley like some outdoor stage, a punk performance. But it's a Game of Thrones centre, bankrolling new myths. Two silos pocked with rust, offset the barn, telling us we've backed round on ourselves, brambled and briared out of river access. I huff and puff and resent each retraced step. This is the pilgrim's lesson. A circle is as good as a straight line. The map is remade in losing it. Bambridge to Porter Down. Day three begins in a car. The compede has melted to a cushion on the blisters like artificial skin. I waver between being a tourist and a local, immigrant and anthropologist, trying to be open to what each skin can let in. Behind the leisure center, the, the river skin has the slow metabolic pulse of rolling glass. Its banks tell the town, Tesco bags and tenants cans, signs for suicide helplines. We pause along flat riparian fields, listening to reeds sift the damage of dung, of chemical slayers and boosters. Just to prove you're human, find the future in these pictures. We alone walk the road, poor people walk, refugees walk, the homeless walk. This is not leisure or work. It's walking into writing, pulling words from the river and the road. It's walking into time, into imagination, step where our ancestors walked. Another tributary of talk bubbles up, eats the distance how I dreamt out and Craig dreamt over. Craig. On a nameless road hedged between the day's start and end, it begins to rain. First a fog of swaying tiny droplets and then something more like downpour. We put on our max as the smell of muck leaps into the air. We expect a soaking, but the rain lasts only minutes. Can this be an Irish poem? Mm -hmm. Banview B and B is full for the twelfth of July, and we're the uninvited. John texts me, "Give Porter Down a kiss and a kick from me. If you want instant depression, go down Oban Street to Drum Cree, a hard-faced place." Craig says that Northern Ireland is like an abused child, unwanted by its parents. Nowhere have I felt it more. Kinship thrives here and details lost to hectic roads and roundabouts, a back end coming first. I lance my blisters and hope I'll sleep. A 
A dream of L creases me. Walking can't iron it. I need steamy sex. Porter down to ban fruit. The ban is a wide and deep overcast mirror of slate. We zigzag in a double canoe, the divorce boat, says the instructor Steve. We take a while to dance with the current, matching a change in movement and environment. If he goes in, you go in. Don't go in a canoe if you don't want to get wet, says Steve. Like age, I think. Don't live in a body if you can't face getting old. Nothing is watertight. We can only slow its entry. Craig, there are stories we can't tell all at once. The stories that build like sediment. Sometimes this is because of shame and our throats close before the story is opened. The story of my mother's death is like this. The cancer, the care home, the final trip to see family in Bambridge. Cherry knows by the gaps the difficulty of this story. I did not know how painful a pill-filled death could be. How the dying cry out for their mothers, cry out for help for hours and hours, then later when the morphine finally tightens a gauze around their world, our drug-stifled cries puff from them, our lungs filling with fluid make their breath sound like the creaking and clacking of winter trees. How even with her son near, she's alone. There is no mother for my mother, no friend, no son. This story is hard to pin onto the shifting sky, the shifting water. But we have time, don't we? Yes, we have time. The paddles slip in quiet and jibble sound as they come out. Ringing to lilies at the banks, the stupas of Rose Bay Willow Herb. Fish jump and thump the surface. Demoiselles flip by in sucker glints. We arrow through Scots pine, oak, alder, and elm, meeting themselves in the water. Travelling up the river's spine, we become direct movement north, nose where the ban noses on the line, not next to it. Awake in the dream, not dreaming it. Pilgrimage is nothing if not taking time, making the path the clock. Do your family sing? Craig asks. Oh yes, a lot. The first two lines of many songs and then we falter into dum de dum he starts up with Buccaneer Augusta in Bambridge town in the county down one morning last July from a boring green came St. Colleen and she smiled as she passed me by. I join in in bits. I didn't grow up with Rosie McCann. I sing the blues. Dad taught me on the road to school. This is the story of a most unfortunate colored man who was rested down in old Hong Kong. He got 40 years privilege taken away from him when he beat old Buddha's gong. I'm more Hoagie Carmichael and the ink spots than the chieftains and Planksty, but the tang of lament flavors what we each sing to the ban. My dad lingers, not here, not gone. I don't want you to see me like this, he said, when his memory began to shrink as he spoke. At Canoe Dock on Heron Boulevard, Ideas wind a rope bobbin. Ban foot to tomb. The belly of the goddess laps five counties. Plantation names like Loch Sydney and Loch Chichester 
didn't stick. Loch Ness spreads its sky, shifting silvery elongations and summer blue into navy. The surface tells of depth, something metallic and dull you think you can hear. Cranky has kind eyes, a protruding lower lip and soft voice. The water has no friends, his dad warned him. The loch is a nisogloss, making the accent more sleepy, less jagged as we travel north. The sound is cosy, more culchy, we would say. Turns out I was a culchy and didn't know it. From culture, Irish for woods, we didn't know it. Eating Irish all those teenage years, unaware of its source. We're learning where English and Irish meet, rub along each other, scratched out at the metal edge of the tongue's border. A wheen of elver fattened below us, turning argent. Readying for autumn, they will starve, burn flesh fuel. Clever non-binary eels, you adapt to lack. Too many and you become male, not enough female. The sea's mantra pulls you north, sargasso, then south, sargasso, as far as the Canaries, then west, sargasso, to spawn and die. 6,000 kilometers twice with Loch Ness, your life's fulcrum. Frankie tells us less come, less leave. Overfished, overheated, overpolluted, their cycle thins. Now elvers are bought from the Netherlands. Accidental zebra mussels are sucking up the fish's food. Less chemicals enter. But the danger keeps coming out of the bedrock. The water has no friends. The septic tank of the north, Frankie calls it. We've ruined all but 25 of Ulster's, all but one of 25 Ulster lakes. No matter how many times I read this, I can't lodge hypertrophic knowing in my bones. The fear of what's to come runs off my surface. We are halfway. Tomb to Port Clanone. We land at Tomb. A trickler phrase from a lamppost, a black flag next to a photo I half recognize. A handsome young man with black hair, thick eyebrows and a cared for handlebar, moustache. It's the 40th anniversary of the hunger strike and we didn't keep count. Craig wasn't born. I was 21 when he died. Kevin Lynch. It's his engagement photo. I marched down O'Connell Street in the rain. I didn't know which way to turn. I entered history through another door. A mourning protest that closed the shame on bystanding. He could have been a father, a grandfather, a first minister, a peace leader. Like the salmon and the eel, he followed instinct, running through his DNA, living off his own volition for 71 days. Ten young men, their jaws kite-like, no fight left, crossed the border without a sound. Can this be an Irish poem? Smell guides salmon to their home river. We are severed east of the Bam with no sight or scent of it. Just as the river is eclipsed by sea, the goddess waits in the shadow of the bright appetite of greed. I disbelieve in goddess, but want the ancient system's strength in such belief.
I've been taught a subtle shunning of anything feminine with power. How far back, Anbana, must I travel to enter memory of your worship, to understand the holy that christened you pre-Christ, the shrines and wells that drew the festivals of cure, the palm-warmed offerings. You all start to, to Cahollan's war dogs and the might of Finn McCool, churched in rumour, then neglected. The damage from the lapse in care cannot be undone. We vigil walk, we vigil talk. When a river is hidden, so is what enters it. In law, in Bangladesh, rivers are people. But women are not always people. Who protects us from the protectors? Before long, the goddess will be fettered, disenchanting, another dead zone, craving a phosphate fix, a nitrate high. We'll find new ways to bury the poison fire. The moon is on her back. I see nothing but black water. Whoever doesn't hear the banshee will surely die. This is boring, says Craig. There will be woods, there will be water. I'm limping on both legs, could none myself at the Cistercian Abbey. We reach the sandy rim, the vulva frock of the band. We race into our togs. A passing woman doesn't look. A plump man walking a black dog says, I don't swim. The plunge is surrender, the stroke resistance, the balance buoyancy carried in the river's horizontal. If she has a body, is a body, then this glossy slop is the band's sex she carries everywhere. You only have to move in her to know. The road removes us. The river invites us back to time's deep body. Port Clanone to Bandura. It's the hottest July on record. With 15 minutes of rain and eight days, can this be an Irish poem? Don't swim in the river at the bar mouth after rain. Rain washes in the effluent. It rose, it keeps rising beyond the hushed pandemic skies and dying seas. Levels and percentages stay abstract like a high fever when you're well. We pass signs to the golf club, the rugby club, the Orange Lodge, the Masonic Hall, and men's sheds. Where are the women's places? I count 17 steps, feet disheveled, every 17 minutes during lockdown, the police were called out to post-romantic violence. And the women with an overnight bag still crossing the Irish Sea to loosen and lose the unwished for. What happens, Craig asks, in an orange hall? Orange men, black bowlers, orange flutes, white gloves, orange songs, I barely know. There were places I refused to see. I never knew anyone in an orange parade. Red hands flutter but no people. The powerful invisibles drive past, barely looking. No Gaelic football posts mark the front gardens. Dab, swing, dab, swing, dab, swing. I got a job for 25 bob on my left, 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 right, left. I got a job for 24 bob on my left, 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 right, left. Craig. My mind steps carefully in Ulster. 
Be careful what you think, be careful what you say. And more than this, be careful about what you think you are allowed to say. Things like Catholic areas seem more welcoming and less severe. Insert something here about Protestant modesty, Presbyterian reserve. Sometimes these stereotypes seem to hold water. Now let me be suspicious. You were always going to say that. You inherited this thought. It is mental undertow. Let me be doubtful. There are no differences and everywhere has been much the same. The architecture has been in square uniformity on both sides of the ban. The houses separated from the landscape like curds from whey. You have noticed only what you think the journey requires. I'm getting to know the North again. People turned away from the river because it stank. I turned away from the land because it hurt. Funny that the ban was mooted as the island's dividing line, losing Belfast, keeping Derry. What shape the battle might have taken. There's still places of such anger they need a peace wall. 116 places some att attracting terror tourists. The news reports that Soldier F will not be prosecuted for killing two men, and another Bloody Sunday case folds. They say immigrants outnumber unionists, showing ways to be Irish with a hyphen. Dab, swing, dab, swing, dab, swing. Neglected places used to frighten me more than sadden me 40 years ago. A man in the country, in city clothes, was a threat. Dark spored from him, from the land he walked on, from beneath the land. A hiding place, a weapon, a body. Jean McConville. Turn swiftly, but not sharply, as if you were blind, and seen nothing, no one. That has passed. What is left? Who's my people? People with no people. People with words picked with love as people. But not people who say, we're all just people. I went to a service in that church there. That's where the fields, the field where I had wild sex. The bus took us this way for years. I was born in that hospital. Craig sees red where I see orange, sees food where I see weed, sees chaffinch where I see birds, he sees hill where I see wrath. He teaches attention to smell, to plumage and pellage, the feel of language in his mouth, the feel of white poplar leaves between his fingers, the underside of living things. He hums the dark hedges inside himself. He sees what I block out, the signature of bigots, the wounds crossed, fear fosters. Now speaking in a third voice, like the offspring of divorce. We're characters from an Irish tarot, the green man and the orange woman. Craig. It seems nature is second nature, but it only seems. I couldn't always tell oak from sycamore or wren from dunnock. In Thornhill, the council estate I was raised on, fewer names were needed, fewer even known. Plants were just plants, birds just birds. I was young, eight maybe, and asked mum the name of a tree in our front garden. The door ajar, she turned to me, eyes weary. It's a tree. Too keen as always, I pursued. But what kind of tree? It's just a fucking tree. And mum disappeared into the darkness of the house. I don't want to say I don't have to say. It would be simpler not to say and fit that old adage 
whatever you say, say nothing, that versed my childhood. Today I mention a father being thrown through a window by a brother, the night patrol to find his plastered body, the day patrol to lock the drinks cupboard, to sweep dirt and hoover glass. Like stepping into a ruin, there's safety in it because the roof has already fallen in. He broke blood's rule of touch. Several walls are barely standing. The unimagined things imagined unimaginable. The walls are girls. The door is always open to him. If the crime is hidden, so is what delivers it. Craig listens, keeps listening among the moss. In plain sight, signs hide. Orange man, gun man, Jesus. How's the form, Boyle? Now we're on the last stage. Bandura to Barmoy. If I could have swum, I would have swum home at that point. Home is where the map runs into blue. I'm always returning to blue, misnaming mouth as source. We end where I began, and as the river cycles to cloud to bog, I cycle from land to air to sea to city, collecting words fresh to me and lost to me. I become different people, pronounce peace differently, think about difference differently. I will die now, the power of circular completion being so strong. New line, old circle, Irish named it Soa, the whole fish make in a river, river bed to spawn. My father would call me to watch the sunset at the bar mouth he can no longer see, no longer walk to. Mussenden Temple, a echo with no shape attached. My nonagenarian pop, my world journeyman, is at the head of the road, full of holes. He grasps sound from sentences in waves that break, but are no longer part of the same shore. Has my wife perished, he asks of sundown. Can't tell if he's missed his own bereavement. Oh, Dad, she's in the next room. I need somebody to love me. Need somebody to carry me home to San Francisco and Barberry, my body there. Craig. Can the river belong to me now? Are the bonny banks of the ban now my banks? Is ban bridge my bridge? I wanted this pilgrimage to have the thrill of a skywide beginning with the comfort of a closed end. But it's the other way around. The start was a trickle in a marshy field and the end is the Atlantic. I belong to these questions like a son belongs to a mother. A rescue helicopter thrums overhead. The tide pulls light seaward. The river belongs to the turns. What else has the river carried from sleeve muck, as well as our watching? A bird's thran peeping. Driftwood, detergent bottles. I've carried love 
for the itinerary of flocks. I'm more salmon than dolman. I hold absence so close I can't feel it. The river will leave with me, living from its own source that I visit, always visiting. We touch the base of the lighthouse, hug and toss our sticks into the river sea where the salmon and eels come and leave. Less come, less leave. Those days outside, unwindowed, doorless, soft, cornered, thinning to road, to river, housed by sky, bred a hobo, love. Pain tramped through us to a billowing beyond matter, the river's lesson. At sore, matter's sore edge, none of it mattered. We walk back along the pier. We are 60% water. Today, we're 60% ban. The water has friends. This can be an Irish poem. Thank you. Well. Wow, well, um, Sheila would agree that that was a really amazing reading, and what a what a distillation from such a fluid and and kind of extensive book. You really managed to dip in and out there amazingly, and um, yeah, I don't. <laughs> Find it quite hard to come straight out of something like that and just be able to launch into a Q&A. But what we would like to do is have a Q&A. Um, and I'm sure there are so many of you who, are, who want to respond to this. Um, maybe while people are gathering their thoughts, um, I, I might start where you, where you finished. Um, and the final line of the poem, which is, this is an Irish poem. Um, and you all heard presumably that the, the kind of refrain that runs right through this, um, the question, is this an Irish poem? Would you like to talk about that refrain and kind of what it means for the project? Big question. Yeah, I mean, I think everybody has that idea of, we all have an idea of Ireland as a wet green place. And um, you go there and then eight days walking and it rains for 15 minutes and you think, is this going to be a wet green place? Is this going to be what I expected at all? And if it isn't, what does that make the country and what does that make me? And, you know, that's where it really started. This really can't be an Irish poem because it doesn't feel like the, the place is changing. And, um, and then could it be because Craig never lived there? He's only got his Irish passport recently because of Brexit and I've lived here for 40 years what you know where does Irishness begin and end and um, lots of people are now getting their Irish passport who've never lived there who've you know maybe not even been there um, so it was really looking at how do we frame identity and um, kind of walking the land made us into that, into those kind of, into cl closer connection with ourselves, with our Irishness, with landscape, with climate change, all of those things which, you know, are testing all of our positions um, as, uh, as walkers, as lookers, as, you know, writers, all of those things are, are really being very challenged. Yeah, I mean, thank you for that. There's, there's so much there, isn't there, about First of all, this kind of tentativeness, which I thought was beautifully captured by the refrain, and that sense of kind of building throughout with the return to this question. If you're still asking the question, is something happening? And, and it does. It, I, I thought that was beautifully managed in the poem, the way this sense of connection develops, which is not, you know, sort of authorized by I've lived here for 40 mm. years, or, you know, I have the passport, you don't have the passport, that it's a different kind of connection and that kind of opening out of identity into difference, I guess. 
um, seemed to me incredibly powerful. So thank you. Mm -hmm. So this is a woman of an Irish passport. She really doesn't count as Irish. So uh, I guess there's a press and dimension to that response as well. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Um, could I invite questions from the audience now? Um, anyone who's ready to speak? Yes, uh, we have a question from the back. I might be giving you a microphone so we can hear you. That's all right. I'm sure we'll hear her. She's very clear. <laughs> I'm going to try to talk quietly into the mic so I don't break it. <laughs> Uh, did you find what you were looking for? Are you satisfied with the answer or is there more walking to do? Yeah, I think I, I say in one of the passages I didn't read that the river wasn't what I went looking for. It was really about consolidating friendship and in a way walking towards my dad and walking home was really important because he was dying. Um, and then I think, you know, thinking... I have to settle with the itinerary of flux. And that's been since I left, since I was 18, I left the North, 22, I left Ireland. And so it is 40 years and I'm like, okay, that's just it. I may never go back or I go back and forth. And I'm like the river, I cycle. It, it gave me a bigger metaphor. And as you know, if you've been my student, I really believe in metaphors as healing. And I feel when you've got an image and you can change the image, you change yourself. You know, and and that's it, it's just a little bit more peaceful within me. I may never resolve it, but I don't feel like I'm going to die here as one of those old Irish ladies who goes, "I should be back in Balamani." <laughs> what are we doing here? I'll just go. Yeah, this is this is what it is, and you know, I'll probably have a wonderful nurse from the Philippines or from Jamaica, and I'll be like, "This is what I chose. I chose chose a broader frame," and you know, that's it. Thank you very much. That was a beautiful point, actually. Um, before you mentioned uh, the 40th anniversary of the hunger strike, when no one was keeping count, but you mentioned the river had no friend. How would you relate that to your... I mentioned what after the hunger strike? The re before the hunger strike, you mentioned the river has no friend. Oh, the river has no friends, yeah. yeah. How would you relate that to your experience? I mean, how, how does that relate to what you, your quest? I think um, Frankie was a, a, a fisherman on, on the loch for years and years, and he knew the loch so well he knew how to name it and where there were sandy bits and rocky bits and and his knowledge was so intense you'd think he could know everything about the water and its changes when it got rough or smooth and he said you know the water has no friends it, even though you know it and you've worked your life on it it will just turn on you and drown you in a second and that feeling of it being a warning to fisher people but now it's a warning to us, like it's a call. If the water is no friends, who's looking out for water, both fresh water and seawater and its creatures? I mean, we have to be water. We have to look after this. We have to be stewards of it. He was a steward now of, of the loch. And, and I just feel there has to be some way that I can transmit that, that concern and anxiety and fear. Um, will you be water's friends you know like the fact you've come the river is hidden you know is great because it wasn't sort of a very sexy title you know it's not like you have to come to this reading it's going to be amazing you know it's like what is it what is the river and if it's hidden what's what's hidden it and you've come and that's that's really great so i think it's it's connecting to whatever pulls you to try and safeguard of our earth really that's that's one of the main messages in 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 the poem and the in the piece and the hybrid piece. Yeah, a hunger strike is a whole different question. But I thought how I've always been very concerned. If I was brought up in a very strongly Republican Catholic part of Belfast, I think I probably would have gone out there and fought. You know, I, I'm a very headstrong person, and I just feel like. Um, what 
you know, what drove those people to make those decisions and to starve for your country 71 days till you died, you know, and you're 22 or, you know, that guy, Kevin Lynch, I think I was 21, he was 23 or four. I mean, he was a few years older than me. And then I thought, isn't he just like the salmon? You know, he's just pulled to do it. He just had to do it. He, he, he had what it took to swim whatever it was, what is it, 60,000 kilometers or something, you know, it's like, it's, it's just start trying to understand that, that volition of the revolutionary, really, and the freedom fighter, the terrorist, whatever you call it, um, you know, what would it take for you to, I, and I think of it in other con, um, contexts as well, if we were all sitting in Turkey now, you know, some of the things I'm saying, might be, you know, get me arrested, get half of you arrested for being here. And then you're going, what did I say? You know, what was it? What, what particular thing was it that upset you that felt, you know, too Western or not Muslim enough or whatever, you know? So I think these questions are ongoing for all of us, especially if we're thinking and we're thinking as writers. Were you going to speak, Eve? Are you going to speak after him? The name was a question as you're answering. I'm just checking to see if anyone Thank you so much for the poems. They were wonderful. Um, my question was I had some, um, there's a statement about Banshee. Um, he, he does not hear the Banshee, but will die or something. Mm -hmm. What is Banshee and what does that statement actually mean? A Banshee um, is, is a spirit, a female spirit, and she roves around and she can howl or call when there's death coming. So if you heard this weird howl, it meant death could come for you or it could come for somebody in your house. And it can stand for female power or um, a sort of um, visionary or um, a Cassandra kind of character. And um, it was, you know, a mythical character, but then, you know, like women were very um, inspired by that knowledge, if you like. Um, and I just, I just was very lucky to hear that story when I was there. And the other question is the link between Ban, which is woman, and then Bana, which is goddess, and the river is named after the goddess, and that was kind of haunting me the whole walk, because I was like, I'm going to have to deal with the goddess, and I spent my feminist years running away from things to do with goddesses. Um, but, you know, it, it felt really suddenly very important to go back to that pre-Christian pagan relationship with the river where they just thought the river was this amazing female form that could cure them and and transform them and and we've we've really lost sight of the power behind that image and i think to our detriment you know um if you i mean i don't want to get too essentialist but there's a lot of things about the greed and 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 consumerism that is very driven by a male energy, you know, a patriarchal energy, and how do we start to reposition ourselves in relationship to that, as the Greenham women did, and as a lot of Extinction Rebellion people are doing, you know, really looking at other ways to think about power and think about protest, and yeah. Well, we already have our next speaker question lined oh, up. Sorry. That was amazing. Of course it was, Jerry. Absolutely amazing. And my question is not going to surprise you at all. Oh, will it? Because you know I'm a great fan of yours. So I'm wondering, I'm hearing a new conception of history from you in this work. I mean, I've yet to read the whole thing. But I wonder if you could tell us something about um, is it true that there's a new conception of history for you in this work compared to famished or anything previous? Well, as you know, Famished, which was about the Irish famine, took me back to the mid-19th century, and I was screaming and kicking the whole way. I was like, I'm not going to do this. It's too sad. It's too hard. How can I carry it? And I just studied the whole history of the period. And the poem 
I mean, it was fragmented. And once that I settled with those fragments, I was kind of fine with that. And this poem was like, I had no idea why I was going to the river, why I was doing the walk. I just knew I wanted Craig to come with me because he can forage so we'd never be hungry, you know, or eating <laughs> elderflower and stuff, you know, it was great. And he was a better map reader, all of that. But I really, and it sort of describes this in, there's a prose preface to the book. I really had no idea what I was looking for. And interestingly enough, there were moments like the goddess and like when I talk about the hunger strike and going in that march for the hunger strike when I was in Dublin as a student. Um, and I just very quietly said, I didn't know which way to turn. And then the publisher said, Mm -mm, go deeper go you're holding back and that bit where I had to describe what it meant to the shame of bystanding you know as a Protestant in a way and my background I wasn't meant to go on that march you know I wasn't meant to be so sympathetic or believe in it and and in a way I was just so moved by the desperation of it and so there were a couple of moments where when he said you're holding back, I knew exactly where I was holding back. And I didn't, again, I didn't want to go there because the troubles are still very, very uh, unsettled in me and in a lot of people. What do we do with it? What, what can come out of it? You know, that thing, can we move on? What does that mean? So in a sense, it's a new history because it's current and it's, it's really current because I, I'm just having to look at it like this. And I think, again, because my dad has gone now, there's something about Ireland coming into place as a parent. And my, my history is like right up there, you know, something that's about the concertina of time when you lose a parent. Um, it really brings up lots of questions about where you should be. <laughs> But yeah, I think I think you're right, and it's it's very scary. I and mean, I think Katerina talked to me said about that thing about having permission, and um, a lot of these things feel quite dangerous to even bring up and say. So maybe because I'm not living there, I can do that. I don't know, but yeah, let's see what the historians say. Yeah. Do you have any other questions? Thank you. And just behind the bar, yes. Hello. Is that on? Okay. Okay. Yes. Thank Thank you. Um, that was lovely. Uh, there seems a strong element of music within the poem, explicitly, implicitly, and also your performance and previous performance that you've done. Um, how did that come about? What influence has that had in the production and post-production? Yeah, well, again, with Famished, I just felt like I couldn't just get up and do 10 minutes about the Irish famine and then sit down again. And I felt like... The, the aspect of mourning and the aspect of creating an atmosphere where there could be some release from this, you know, long-held suffering and unacknowledged deaths and things. And with this one, I felt like, you know, something, I wanted something much jauntier that, that, that followed the journey and spoke about the journey and, um, Obviously, we did sing when we were in the canoe boat because we were so scared of capsizing. And, and, you know, then it was really Craig singing Irish traditional songs, which I don't really know, and then me singing jazz. And, and then it felt like the river was, you know, bringing that out in us and the walking, the rhythm of the walking. And sometimes you just think, I can't do another step. And then one of you starts telling another story and then you do another two miles or four miles. Um, so we worked with this flautist who's amazing and when we performed the first time Craig and I swap places for every section and she stays in the middle and she's like the river going going through it and she composed the first piece you hear is the band jig which she composed for the piece 
And then other pieces, I mean, she had to play disco, she had to play blues and traditional, and she's a really consummate um, traditional uh, flautist. And she was like, you know, no, I can't do that. We've got her doing ping, ping, ping for the rain. She was like, oh no, I couldn't do that. So it was pushing her as well. And I really found that really interesting that I could, um, you know, interrupt a story in, in traditional music in the way I'm interrupting a story of Irish landscape poetry, perhaps. Um, and then the second performance we did with Fiddle, um, which Razvan was there, a few of you were there, and it, it had a very different, the flute was really watery and high and lovely, and then the fiddle was like, hey, get up there, it was like hitting you here, it was very, very different. And people did start to clap at the end, and that was sort of, you know, it is quite extraordinary how music gives you permission to, to express yourself and come more wholeheartedly into the poem. I don't think I can ever work alone now. I'm giving that up. I'm just like, I'm so, I just love performing. I'm like, it's, it's so exciting. And it brings a whole new audience to the, to the event, you know, who won't come and hear a poem. Bob knows that, you know, they, but they'll come if it's an event. And, you know, it, is that any different? I mean, it's, it's just, it's very exciting really to explore that whole interdisciplinary thing and see what it brings up and having the nerve to sing because I've never really sung in public before you know so it's all um yeah being in the work as fully as I can and yeah I mean once a few years ago I went into Trinity School of Music and I tried to get a few musicians to come over and work with us on our work and it was very difficult to get anyone but I'm going to try again because now one of the people I've improvise with is teaching there so I think it would be a really beautiful thing to try and develop for next term for the end of term stuff yes um hmm. do we have any more no back up again yeah one or two yeah or I'll, we'll be around. We're going to have drinks and do the book signing and everything. Um, I see. But um, there was one couple of lines in there when you spoke about um, about um, spoke about the capital population increasing and uh, immigration ranging and some of the sort of change in the dynamic. A lot, mm -hmm. and there was, I just got the feeling of this, um, uh, this kind of uh, uh, an, an, an inevitability of what's happening in the future of Northern Ireland. And mm -hmm. it's almost like everyone kind of knows what's going to happen in the future, but no one really wants to talk about it yeah. and go that way. And you know, just with the, the river flowing in that direction, mm -hmm. it's got its feed in that. Is that, is that what you're trying to get to that, really? In that, in that yeah, I mean, it's sort of exploring it at one point we saw this quite sad little birthday card happy birthday northern ireland 100 years and i just thought well it won't see another hundred and then i thought well will it you know and i i wasn't even sure because i felt you know it was more inevitable a few years ago and now people are really resistant in the south because they don't want to pay for the north and then the North have got all these resistances around healthcare. And so it, it's not, um, I mean, even further back when I sort of thought borders were dissolving a bit, I felt quite hopeful. I, I don't know. I, I think um, it'll be interesting to see how it builds in a sort of federate way, I think. But there's lots of interesting writing about it. And there's this big thing called Future Ireland, which is doing like a public assembly citizens assembly in cities all over ireland and getting huge crowds and they're kind of undercutting the politicians who as we know are completely at a standstill there so that's very very hopeful and interesting and i'd quite like to go to one of those things um, in fact i'd love to do this at one of those things just to open it up and I'd love to have some flute players from an orange band piping it in you know like really kind of trying to claim what culture you know that you know we're all afraid of that culture Catholics and Protestants are afraid of it but you know what is there that we can have and celebrate and 
I was just opening that door a little bit. Um, yeah, I hope it happens in my lifetime. It's a very emotional thing, really. And then I start thinking about what that means in terms of nationalism. And it's, it's yeah, it's complex, isn't it? Yeah. Do we have one more question? Yeah, uh, this one's a bit personal. Uh, I just want to know how long it took you to compose the poem and how you felt at the end of it. In, in terms of, in terms <laughs> That's a really good question. I feel a lot happier now than I did about two months ago. It was the weirdest process I ever had. I think because I was collaborating, if I just gone and done it on my own, I would have sat with it a lot, lot longer and I would have not been called to participate with it. And uh, I might not even have finished it, to be honest. I don't know, I'm not sure. It might have been a smaller thing within a bigger book, I've no idea. But at the end of it, Craig and I went to a writing retreat and we just wrote for three days. We didn't speak to each other, we just wrote. Wrote, 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 wrote. And then we met up about a month later and we read each other things. And already I felt like I was writing for him or to him, which was kind of lovely, but also a bit weird because, you know, a lot of it was still in my head. And then we met up, we all both did more writing. And then we met up and we cut out bits of our writing, put it all around this room and then read bits and then saw where there were parallels, crossovers, you know, and we weren't even going to do it day by day because that felt too obvious. But in the end, it was just too crazy. We had too many themes and everything. So structure is sometimes quite good in a long poem, even though it seems obvious. Um, but uh, then I was finished and I said, right, I'm finished. This is over. I've done enough in this. And then we sent it to the publisher and the publisher said, oh, no, you're not finished. <laughs> And I was so darn hearted because I'm a very impetuous person. Get it done, you know. I'm, that's why I work in the small form, you know. And he, the publisher said, no, both of you are holding back. Go away and write more about the context. Write more about those difficult things. And we wrote every day practically for two months. And then we were really collaborating and really sending things back and forward. And he was almost speaking in my voice. I was speaking in his. And it was really lovely. Then it began to really work as a collaboration. So that was a whole different thing. I wrote a lot more prose than I have for a while. And then it began to make more sense. And then I thought, is it, is it ever going to work? And then we performed it and then it seemed to work. So I really, I said to someone, it's like braiding air and water, you know, where is it going? What is it? And um, I think that groundlessness is one of the hardest things as an artist to stay in, where you, you have to deal with the unknown and you really, it's so scary and no one else can do it for you. <laughs> Um, but yeah, it's a kind of surprise to both of us. Uh, and, you know, I hope you get a chance to see the full performance because it is a very much more perhaps involving thing, but, um, and then you get to really, you know, in Ireland, I could see people going, oh, Craig's just an actor. He, he didn't even write that. He's an English boy. He doesn't really know all this. And then, you know, when he spoke, they were like, come on, man. Yeah, you're one of us. You know, it was just so bizarre. And then when we performed in England, it was like there was a different, you know, people were identifying with him and then, you know, I was something else. So it was really an interesting um, paradox in some ways. Yeah. But yeah, it was, a, it, was, it was a difficult process, a difficult birth. And he would say the same, but we never didn't get on. It was just like, what is this thing? We're building and dissolving and building and dissolving all the time until you get your form um, and you know Craig said when we got the the, the leaflet for the, yeah. for the sh first show he was like phew we've got an image it must be something <laughs> you know it was like that it was very strange uh, not like other processes at all and it shouldn't be it should be different every time like you shouldn't be able to you know always think it's going to be the same each each book or each process yeah are you a writer are you 
Okay. Okay, so is that is that it? Yeah, I think um, you have done us proud and given us a, a, an absolutely amazing reading and such rich and thoughtful answers. So thank you so so much. Um, if there's anyone who wants to chat, to yeah, you afterwards, yeah, that'd be um, lovely. So you will be mobbed, and um, that's that's our plans. Um, everyone, um, thank you so much for coming. It's been amazing to have such uh, an attentive and responsive audience.